Okay, welcome back. Um, we're at uh, <clears throat> week 12 and we're moving into our next topic. Um, uh, I, I did want to spend a little bit more time on this topic. However, we may, uh, you know, we're just going to bridge this. This uh, The topic going forward is what we're looking at particular issues in counseling. Um, and we're going to be just broadly uh, picking up a couple of um, relevant areas. We're not looking at how counseling would happen in these areas generally, but we're just going to have um, an overview. So in this hour, as well as the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at mental health. We're going to be looking at marriage and family. Uh, next week on, we'll be looking at um, counseling the abused, uh, grief counseling, and counseling in depression and suicide. So these are some common topics that we are just picking up to have a real overview and this is very basic in its nature. Um, this is just for uh, overall understanding. Um, if, if, you may, if you are interested in more, there, there definitely requires a lot more of uh, exploration in these areas and a lot more learning. But this is just like, um, you know, tip of the iceberg for you to just, um, you know, uh, pinch your interest a bit and that's all that this is meant to do because the course in itself is limited in in how much we could cover because these are extensive topics in itself but it is just to build an awareness um, about for today it's just mental health and marriage and family that we are going to spend so I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes on each to give you an overview of what can you expect or what are some of the things that um, you need to identify that like, you know, there's someone who has a mental health issue, you need to know that they're going through a mental health issue. Or if there is a family or a child who's coming with you with a certain problem, you need to know that, you know, there is there are problems like this, uh, so that you use your wisdom to deal with them. Okay, um, just give me a minute, I'll just quickly uh, um, share my screen. Okay. All right. So we're going to be uh, looking at, uh, uh, the, like I said, the speci specific particular issues in counseling. And I'm on page um, 42 of the book. Uh, that I may not go through everything in detail. I'm just going to give you a little bit, some a few things that's outside of, uh, of our understanding of this. Uh, but broadly, I'd like to uh, cover a couple of things that's important for us to know is to, first of all, let's for us to understand what is mental health. Now, if you look at the uh, definition that's given in your book, it says mental health is a level of psychological well-being or an absence of a mental disorder. Um, so it, it mental health is a sense of well-being that a person has or you know, someone who may not have a mental disorder. Now, it is a state of someone or of, of people who are able to function in different areas of their life to some form of op optimacy or, uh, or adjustment, okay? So it's a state where, where an individual is able to function in different areas of their life. And here, if you look at this slide, um, it talks about eight dimensions of well-being or of or of wellness. And I and I want to quickly go through each of this just for us to understand why the, this is important. Okay. Um, so number one is you know just being able to maintain a, a good mental health is a balancing act. And if you look at this uh, wheel, there are many factors that make up our mental well-being. It is from our personal lives to our social lives, from our occupation to even our spirituality. So when certain areas of our life are out of balance, there can be certain compromises that are made to our mental health or a sense of not feeling okay. Okay. Now, this is especially true with those who live with mental illness. Mental illness, remember, um, is, is, is another layer uh, to, that, that you have to the balancing act of keeping a good mental health. 
okay and uh, so we're talking about mental wellness all right and one of the helpful tools that we can look through is something that we say is the wellness wheel it is it's a very simple easy to use resource that um, that you know that can offer a way to look at the different aspects of life that affect our mental health so this um, wellness or let's say mental wellness is the concept of a positive mental health and the absence of uh, uh, of an illness or absence of a disease so reaching a place of wellness um, is generally not always straightforward and maybe there are no certain signposts that actually marks you to say that you are completely mental mentally well but this is a pathway to well-being and for us to just ensure that um uh you know a lot of these areas are in a place of optim optimal health so this wellness wheel recognizes a, a multifaceted approach that is um, a very effective way to work towards mental well-being so it's it's you know it's a, it's a very visual tool and we understand the factors that affects it so we'll just go through there are eight dimensions of it i'll just quickly go through each of this so that um, you know we are able to recognize that it is important that an individual be uh, healthy in these different areas <clears throat> so the when we are looking at the emotional i'll start with that the emotional um uh, part or the emotional wellness is uh, it, it's your it's where your to know that our emotions affect everything um from the mood to our mindset to our outlook on on the world so our emotional wellness as we have we've been talking about consists of our thoughts our emotions and our capacities to deal with challenges that come about in our lives so when one is struggling with emotional wellness they have a hard time feeling content or even sharing how they feel with others or even being able to relax but when you're doing well emotionally well you can experience your emotions as they are while still feeling good about yourself okay so that's what we look about in emotional wellness in physical wellness and that is something that doesn't need much of an explanation but it is another pillar that holds this overall mental health so caring for your body listening to the cues it gives you um are important parts of maintaining uh, this 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 area so when you neglect your physical wellness it can definitely cause uh, a poor a lack of sleep it can it can cause illness it can cause injuries even eating good food getting good exercise are ways and of course maintaining a good sleep cycle are all ways to contribute to this physical wellness that of course leads to um a good mental mental health balance the next one is um we can look at uh, intellectual now intellectual wellness doesn't mean that you need to be a genius that's not what it means it just refers to being engaged uh, mentally in in mentally stimulating or creative activities that engage your mind so intellectual wellness means that you're able to think critically you're open to ideas you're looking for certain outlets um, that are creative and that are critical so signs of intellectual wellness have a strong sense of self uh, it has a good set of values that you live by um, as well as the ability to question um, and challenge yourself so that's what the intellectual wellness is about the social wellness involves your connections around you between you your family uh, your friends people you're working with your colleagues your acquaintances or anyone else in your life so having strong relationships in uh, one's life makes a huge difference in mental health that's that's seen as one of the greatest indicators of good mental well, wellness that is having a good social support system when the social when when your social wellness is strong you often can communicate effectively you are able to be in a group well you are able to develop a relationship with others you are able to see others grow help others through their journey of life so that's what social wellness is and environmental wellness is that which refers to your surroundings that is from your personal to your professional life so having a positive environmental wellness means that you are aware of the spaces you spend your time in you know and the spaces which 
which are healthy. So when you're surrounded, let's say in any space, maybe at work or at home or at, uh, or, or at any other social setting that you are in, if you're surrounded by stress and negativity, your mental health is going to suffer. On the other hand, when you ensure that your uh, when when you're able to be engaged in a good environment, it keeps you motivated to reach your goals or to keep you safe, or uh, even though there may be difficulties and challenges. The next one we see here is occupational um, wellness. Again, uh, this, this means working in something that is either in a career or in a vocation that brings meaning and purpose for the work that you do. So if you work in a place that doesn't make you feel useful or satisfied, it's going to bring one down and leave you feeling you're wasting your time. But when you're dedicated to occupational wellness, you're actually doing the work that interests you and motivates you to work hard and also do your best. Then comes financial wellness. Although we see that you know finance and money isn't everything, having money is an absolute necessity in life. And it can be an incredible stressor uh, and a severe lack of it can have a serious negative impact even on the mental health. So dedication to uh, financial wellness is, uh, is eliminating anything that brings about a stress. So financial wellness involves making responsible choices about your living, responsible ways of spending, of investing um, within your means so you can contribute to the success uh, that, that, that is there for you. And of course, uh, the spiritual wellness, which um, involves the practice of, um, uh, uh, you know, building on your on. Now, remember, we are talking about this in general, right? So building on your on the system of belief uh, that matters to you, or you recognizing your purpose in uh, in life with with God, right? So that's now when, when you're looking at it from a believer's perspective, it is uh, it is you you see that this is it is the system of belief and value that you build in in Jesus, right? That really helps to cultivate that wellness and be see that um, when you dedicate that to dedicate time in cultivating that spiritual wellness, there is a lot of positive mental health benefits that we see. So when we look at this entire wheel, it gives us a good understanding of where of, of what it takes to be mentally well. Now, quickly to just look at what can be certain factors that lead to mental ill health or mental disorders, okay? And I want to label, uh, now this is not a complete list, but I've tried to put in as much as I can, I, I have, I've been able to bring up, okay? There are certain factors that affect mental health or, or you would say like when, when you do, when you find someone who has a mental illness, okay? Someone with either depression or anxiety or, or any, anything to with that spectrum, which I have a slide on, um, we, we look at different factors that contribute to mental disorder. And uh, when we look at the biological factor, so there are three specific domains, okay? Um, that is, what are biological factors? What are social factors? What are psychological factors, all right? So biological factors is something uh, uh, the, uh, something that science has come up and is, is beginning to learn and understand is that a lot of major mental health disorders are because of neurochemical changes or, or changes in the brain because of neurochemical transmissions of certain um, uh, neuro, neuro, neurochemicals. So, so they, there is a huge part of neurochemistry that plays in the role of a mental health disorder. There can be genetic predisposition. That is, you know, having a family member with a mental illness makes it more likely for another individual to have a mental illness. Um, mental illness can come as a result of certain medication and side of, uh, certain side effects of certain medication. Uh, people taking too much of a medicine for long periods of time can affect in maybe anxiety, can affect in depression or other kinds of uh, disorders. 
there can be somatic disorders um you know very very often uh, somatic is everything to do with the body aches and pains that come which are a lot more biological in nature like for example um you know people who have uh, rheumatoid uh, rheum rheumatism often do have somatic disorders and uh, that in itself can can lead to um uh, to a mental health concern okay a lack of physical exercise a lack of nutrition can lead to mental health concerns substance abuse too much of a substance either alcohol um or other sub drugs can can deal with, can uh, bring about a mental health concern or developmental issues like with regard to especially when you're looking at autism or um mental mental retardation or developmental delays all of them have a biological component to it okay now when we look at uh, psychological factors uh the way that and here there are a couple of things over here your personal identity uh how uh, how you've seen yourself and where is it that you hold your identity to your emotional health which is something we've spoken about your cognitive factors the way that you think the way that your thinking process go goes maybe it's a it's a large pessimistic way of thinking that can lead to mental health concerns there could be certain behavioral factors you know certain patterns of behaviors that you've grown up in um that could affect uh, mental health coping skills how would how how strong is one's resilience in the midst of an affliction uh is something that causes uh, uh mental health issues and of course the sense of purpose and this is where i want to go back to the those three crucial needs we've spoken about you know the the fact of uh, uh the need of love the need of security and the sense and the need for a purpose often you know when when none of that is there it can lead to a mental health concern social issues we see culture religious beliefs often can lead to uh forms of uh, of mental health concerns and what do we mean by religious beliefs you know uh, often think like for example of um um uh, completely negating that sometimes depression can be absolutely biological in nature and it could be uh, you know the belief or the thought that you're a weak person or you do not have enough faith in god and that in itself can create uh, a sense of pressure that could go that could have a certain illness be untreated and uh, as a result you know uh, have significant difficulties in in the mental health um interpersonal relationship issues within in relationships can affect mental health um social support gender identity how one sees their gender uh, again even sexual orientation that in itself can uh, which is way down in that list but sexual orientation also can affect mental health the expectations um that one has of themselves societal expectations um uh, that come by can bring about a lot of mental health issues family background employment status environmental events socio economic status disability all of this uh, uh have a potency to cause some kind of a mental health challenge okay now i've gone through this list very quickly just for us to uh, have an idea as to what really affects um uh, what 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 are the factors that affect mental health or what contribute to mental health uh, uh, issues okay moving forward uh, quickly just to give you an overview of what are the different kinds of mental health disorders why is this important to know is because you know um when especially when counselees come to you there may be there is a need to understand if they are going through a mental health disorder and usually when people are going through a uh, florid symptoms of a mental health disorder counseling is counterindicative you know you do not counsel someone who has a florid mental health disorder they may require a a different level of intervention before you can come to a place of counseling them or even giving them spiritual mentorship okay now uh, broadly there are different categories but we've just kept around eight so that um, you know it's easier to understand mood disorders like depression or bipolar disorder now there are two major mental health disorders and it's the first one and the sixth one on this list mood disorders is depression and bipolar disorder often require medication 
Uh, the sixth one is schizophrenia. It's called a thought disorder that there are um, issues in the way one thinks and uh, that in itself causes uh, an um, uh, being outside of the of the reality that they are in okay so one and six that is labeled over here are what we would generally suggest as major mental health disorders okay the minor mental health disorders uh, these are no more classified like this but um, you know i just felt that it's important for us you know for our learning activity just for us to know uh, this classification will actually also just be helpful in minor mental health disorders is where you will find anxiety okay anxiety disorders are those that is a generalized anxiety worry fear over over things so that's the anxiety disorder um post traumatic stress disorder is usually seen when there is a when there is some form of trauma that happens you know either it's an environmental trauma it's a natural trauma or a personal trauma like for example let's say there is a rape or there is um, abuse or there is an accident or there is a natural disaster that hap happens um, or uh, you know significant uh, emotional abuse that happens over time all of this and post the trauma, there, there seems to be uh, either depression or anxiety, and that's what's called as post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, We also do have obsessive compulsive disorder, and these are more repetitive in nature. Um, people have struggles in, in um, have, have struggles in their thoughts that are obsessive, ruminate thoughts that keep happening and they feel compelled to do something or else you know the anxiety raises up now all of these conditions um, uh, require uh, medical treatment as well as uh, psychological help or uh, you know counseling to deal with that the other uh, and of course even eating disorder eating disorders are those that have their relationship with food is significantly um, 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 in malfunction because of emotional disturbances that are there. So all these four are things that require both uh, a lot of times, both a medical intervention as well as a psychological intervention. There are this the substance abuse disorder is when uh, you know what is commonly known as an alcoholic. You know it's a disease. Someone who has uh, a substance uh, dependence. Uh, is classified to have a disease. And of course, personality disorders are those that have issues in their personality whereby it causes a strong um, uh, issue in their functioning in relationships and uh, in their, uh, in their uh, occupational or vocational self. And personality disorders are generally worked along with some small form of uh, medication, but largely it has to do with counseling and help. So this is important for you to know. I know we haven't gone into details, but you could always read them up to understand what they are so that sometimes it may be important for you to identify that someone who's coming to you has some kind of a mental disorder and really requires help for that before you can pursue counseling on with them. Okay, certain indicators of mental health. How do you know that um, people uh, are in a good place or you know have a have a good mental health? So some uh, some of these, and there are a lot more that's written on your notes. But I'm just going to um, uh, talk about a few of this. Is the the main signs of a good mental health is being satisfied. You know, having a good sense of value to oneself of knowing who you are and knowing whose you are in in our in the in in our language just knowing that you know it, you have value and you've been created with dignity you've been created uh, uh, for for a purpose just being able to know that that in itself is a good sign of of a mental health being engaged in a meaningful activity so having something to do whatever it may be it's not about the outcome or the success but just being meaningfully employed um, or meaningfully engaged I, when i mean by employed it doesn't mean that someone who earns only but just being meaningfully engaged in an activity so it could be studying it could be uh, raising a home it could be doing some actual work it could be doing a business it could be even developing certain vocations or hobbies whatever just being engaged in a meaningful activity 
then a good connection with other people, being able to have stable, healthy relationships um, with people. Uh, that shows that is again is a good good mental health sign. A sense of self control, knowing where to draw a line, uh, uh, in in the way that one one becomes a consumer of things and this could mean different areas it could mean uh, a substance it could mean um uh you know a, a, a certain activity like, like maybe like shopping or um you know an activity like uh, like learning a skill it's not something that needs to consume you so much so that you've lost control over how you work through something um, so it's being able to draw boundaries on what is sufficient and what is not helpful. Okay, so this can it this can be in very many different areas, not just substances, or not just uh, when you're looking at issues like pornography or substances, but it can be in the sense of eating, in the sense of spending money, in the sense of shopping, in the sense of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, going out, whatever, or or you know even even in. Uh, uh, actual activities like sexuality, all of that, you know, it's about having a place of knowing where to draw boundaries, sense of uh, self-control. It's being able to also not hold on to negative emotions um, and like resentment, anger, bitterness, but being able to release and forgive others um, on whatever challenges that they have been. Uh, having optimism and hope, looking uh, with hope to the future is something that you would show uh, you would say is someone who has mental a good mental health someone who's tolerant over people over things over changing uh, situations uh, just being tolerant over the and learning how to adapt in different situations being grateful uh, uh, being having a heart of thanksgiving and of course the last one is uh, having a good sense of humor now now all of this you know helps one to see how they can they can actively engage with themselves with the world outside in a in a manner that isn't uh, um, uh, that that is that is functional rather than it being dysfunctional okay now uh, th this this was a quick uh, just a quick uh, um, you know, overview of what mental health is. But if you look through the, um, uh, uh, the you know, your notes, it kind of helps you see what, as you as a believer or you as a Christian, how do you help someone with mental illness? And you could go through those that list. It's, it's fairly easy. But I just want uh, just a couple of pointers that I want to highlight on is one is to be educated to really know what are these different types, what are the symptoms of mental illness, so that you ha are in a place, especially when you're even in a ministry, you know, you'll be, uh, I'm sure each one of us have come across somebody who's mentally ill in some sphere of our lives. And when I mean by mental illness, I'm not talking about the ones who are, you know, just walking out on the streets and ragged and talking and shouting. No, they could be even in your home, someone who's having palpitations and panic and anxiety or a, or a sense of low self-worth. These are all, uh, you know, uh, symptoms of some form of a mental ill health. May not be a mental disorder, but sense of mental Ill, Ill health. So it's important to be educated and learn about about these types of uh, mental illness. One is to also uh, face uh, for yourself, what do you fear or what are your feelings towards mental illness? Is it something that, that makes you afraid? Now, I know, especially among Christians who think only that mental illness has everything to do with the devil and the evil one, okay? And, and I think that is... That is um, uh, that is a misconception that is not true. There are, uh, like we said, you know, mental illness can come through through very many ways. Yes, one of the ways also can be a spiritual oppressive attack. And yes, the, it, it, it can be there as well. Maybe it started off as something that's biological, but, but just tends to be very long drawn because, you know, there have been open doors that's come in and, and then it, it becomes very, uh, very ingrained. But remember that not all mental illnesses are of the devil or of the of um, you know I can be attributed to the devil. Yes, the, the enemy plays along after a while. So 
to understand that and to face that fear, to know what it is that that may may require your intervention. So there are times. I mean, I've I've seen this with my, uh, you know, uh, in in different scenarios where uh, where there have, there have been people who probably have uh, have have significant uh, someone who's extremely violent okay and uh, you're in to 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 know to have the wisdom to deal with it uh, and and i've seen there are times that christian ministers have gone and you know uh, spoken the devil out of them and still they are manifest they are you know in a place of having these symptoms so it it becomes very clear that there are times that they do need medical and uh, hospital help so just learning to admit your fears and asking um uh, number one to know or, or to be able to discern what needs medical help and what really requires something that is more spiritual okay um uh, other things about um mental illnesses remember that that they are people they are people like you and me and a lot of mental illness can be cured uh can be treated rather uh sorry i think someone has themselves of uh, mute kennedy uh, may i request you to please mute yourself thank you yeah so there can be um uh yeah so those with mental illnesses are people okay and it is it 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 can be treated it can be um, um there are some that may not be in in science they they say that it can't be cured but you know we know different and i've seen uh, people being healed of mental illnesses but remember that they are people they are like you and me however they they may have certain symptoms that make them uh, appear different but to acknowledge that they are god's unique creation that uh, they can be challenged to do things um, just as normally as others would do um, the next thing also is to help families to help families deal with what they are going through because a lot of times it's the families that bear a greater burden um in helping a a, a, me a member who is uh, who is um uh, unwell and to to help with the resources that that there may be available within the community to help so there are rehab centers there are uh, things called as halfway homes for those who are severely mentally ill so these are things that need to be explored and helped and um you know to to ensure that you walk alongside with them and and work with them and i think the rest of some of those pointers is something that you can you can look for in the notes and kind of follow but i just wanted to focus on some that are uh, that are significant and important okay uh, i'm just going to spend the next 15 minutes just quickly dealing with uh, marriage and family and 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 specifically issues in childhood and adolescence um marriage and family um Uh, the common issues that you see and and i think those of us who followed up in the earlier uh semester with marriage and family you know have a have a good idea as to what can be some of the causes of marriage uh, issues the and, and and there is a huge list that's put up over here um there can be issues with uh, unmet expectations that can often arise to um the challenges that come about in families there could be differences in the way um uh people are in their personalities and that also causes uh, concerns the way that people are brought up and the kind of upbringing that they've had the the value systems they've had the roles that they've played all of that kind of affects marriage um, uh, issues and uh, people come with with issues for counseling there can be issues with finances that come about uh, issues with infertility issues with infidelity um with with extended family members that can be addictions that they may have um there could be challenges that come in as a result of divorce and separation there could be issues that come up as a result of illnesses which are specifically uh, physical or mental health in its in itself or there could be just be mere conflicts that occur because of certain environmental events that have taken place so these are broadly the kind of challenges that come by now when you're dealing with marriage um with people in uh when you're working with with marriage 
married couples, right, or within a family, something that you've got to really ensure is that when a family comes to you, remember each one is coming to you with a desire and a hope that you are going to hear them out. Okay, so you're not standing there as a referee. Okay, you're on, you're there as a facilitator. Because a lot of times families, when they're attempting to deal with an issue themselves, they are not able to converse one with another. They are not able to communicate one with another because emotions are running really wild there. So when they have called you in or you are in there, you are not there as a referee or as a one who's siding with one person. Okay, you know, I'm siding for the husband or I'm siding for the wife because she seems to be the most, the victim in this case. You're there, one, to be as a facilitator. You are engaging the entire family in communication to pick up most important points of conflict and working through that conflict. So, so it is important as a family counselor, you provide a secure environment for every member there. And one of the key things that you're doing is actually um, looking at how they relate one to another, really being observant how the family members relate one to uh, one to another or the or the or the husband and the wife relate one to another and bringing back that is a feedback to them. So what is important is when you meet a family for counseling, the first thing that you would do is, you're, you're seeing them as a unit. You're not seeing them as a divided party as they have come, right? And the, the position that you stand and say, okay, what could the two of you as a couple or what could the four of you as a family, what can we work towards in as a goal in counseling, okay? Uh, rather than asking it as an individual, what do you want separately? What, what does the father want? What does the mother want? It's saying, okay, as a, as a collective unit, what is it that we can look forward as a common goal to work on, okay? And as you do that, what you're doing is you're not alienating one from another. You're bringing them up together so that what you're attempting to, to also achieve is to help them to trust one another through the change process, okay? And um, from, from working with a family, what you do, what you are mainly focusing on is helping them develop their goals for change okay if if there is if there is a lack of understanding okay what is the goal that we are going to do if there is a lack of communication how are we going to build uh, to build that communication is if it's a misunderstanding what can we iron out before we can come to a place of understanding if there is infidelity that is that I mean that is a different process in itself, you know, working with one another for forgiveness, working with one another for more trust, working with one another for developing certain um, uh, activities and ways in which they could reconnect one to one to another. So the point that we're trying to make is you as a counselor does not get pulled in to support one member of the family. If you're doing that, you've lost the family. Okay, you remember you're standing as a facilitator to bring them all together so that they can collectively work on a certain goal to help them move forward. Okay, um, uh, Shri Kumar, I'll take your question. I'll just complete this and I'll, I'll come back and take your question. Now, coming to what uh, when you when you when you're dealing with children or when you're dealing with adolescents, remember children and adolescents have other kinds also have different kinds of issues. So if we were to broadly categorize them, uh, again, these are part of your notes. We, can, we categorize them to find out if they, if they do have any mental health concerns, the same way like we spoke about uh, you know, just a while ago, that do they have depression? Do they have any form of addictions? Uh, is there a developmental disorder? You know, um, like, like, for example, um, uh, in that there are children who are what we call as slow learners, okay? And it may not be because they are not paying attention in class or any of that. Developmentally, they, they're, they're, they're not, uh, developmentally, they do not have an intellectual capacity to learn in a normal pace, all right? Or not a normal pace, in a regular pace, like, like how you would expect in a developmental chain. 
So that could be an issue. There could be mental health concerns that you really need to figure out. Okay, Or there could be behavioral concerns. Behavioral concerns are something to do with their conduct. Maybe they're extremely defiant or they're extremely oppositional. There could be severe temper tantrums. There could be uh, violence resulting as a as an as an issue of the behavioral issues that they're going through. So those now these again are all to do. Uh, they do come under psychiatry, especially if there are behavioral con uh, concerns like like uh, defiance or severe opposition, severe rebellion. Uh, and of course, mental health concerns does come under the scope of psychiatry itself. But you need to be aware that children can go through this. So if there is if there is a child who's coming to you with severe issues in behavior and conduct, let's say, you know, has gang fights and, um, you know, uh, walks around with a knife at home, remember that there is a problem there. OK, it's it, it may not always again, do not do not always relate everything to the devil. There can be ways of upbringing that in itself has caused a behavioral difficulty with the child. OK, remember, these can be open doors where the enemy has has picked in and, and got his foothold on. OK, there can be family stressors that happen uh, within children in, in in the lives of children and adolescents because of issues in the family. You can see the the effect in a child because of let's say a divorce or separation or uh, illness within the family or maybe a, a loss or a death uh, in the family can affect the child in in some 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 uh, area of of life okay there can be school stressors there can be difficulty in uh, in the issues at school maybe issues with with learning issues with with people uh, something called a separation anxiety which they are not they are not able to um, stay away from the from the caretaker at home and feel a sense of anxiety with that. There can be peer pressure. There can be bullying. There can be difficulties in learning. You know, not unable to read, unable to write, unable to do math, unable to spell. Now these are all called learning disorders. Now this again is not learning disorders are not because they are poor in academics, but because there is a development disability to actually learn. OK, and they may require specialized forms of treatment. Now, I've given you a very, very broad overview. But um, uh, every time you see an individual with some kind of a difficulty, ask yourself, is this something I may need to read up or I may need to ask someone, you know, this is what is happening. Am I missing something or is this just, uh, you know, some issue that probably can work with counseling? So these are broadly some of the things that we need to be aware of and have certain guidelines as to uh, understanding that there can be different factors that affect the mental health or affect a marriage and family and being a little more uh, open to discover that there could be other issues and finding out what they may, what they may be. OK, all right. I've gone in super mega speed. But uh, yes, Sri Kumar, I'm I'm ready to take your question right now. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I want to know, uh, as you said, uh, you should not be a uh, when you when a, when you are counseling with a with a husband and wife, hmm. uh, you should not take only one side, uh, but you should uh, consider both of them together. In right. any case, in any case, uh, now um, uh, uh, in any case, only the one person is. Uh, coming uh, forward and wanted a counseling regarding to this, and uh, and another person seems to be like um, uh, like um, uh, he's fine. He is not. Uh, he's not having an issue, and uh, he's not interested in this matter at all. The counseling or uh, um, or anything, anything. But uh, if he thinks that he's a perfect person and uh, he don't need any counseling and is only his uh, the spouse and the wife needs a counseling. In that case, how you how we can able to handle uh, this thing, or um, how we will able to move further, and uh, even uh, if they uh, have gone for a counseling session uh, in the past, where the counselors observed that there is a problem with the husband, and um, and after the three, after first, second, third, after the third session, uh, he just. Um, just came out from the uh, room and 
yeah, out. Like he was Drops about out. to hit the council itself. So he became mm-hmm. so violent. And um, so, and he's saying that uh, these are all uh, nonsense. So he's saying that his wife is the only mm-hmm. problem. So in that case, how how we can able to uh, how how we look this this kind of a case, whether it is um, uh, is it connected with spiritual? As we were saying that you know, uh, sometimes we we uh, as a Christian Catholic or sorry, as we spiritual people, we just take everything uh, considered as all demonic. So so even uh, his family also he has seen that how his parents used to uh, how his father used to treat how his uncle used to treat with their wives so they used to take a knife they used to beat so now the same pattern he is using with his family or his wife and his with his children so and um, and um, he's also um, very short temper but um, if you look to him if you meet personally you will never find that he's a he's a person like that but with the family with his especially with his wife and with those children he's a very different person so in this case, uh, how um, how we can judge or how we can come to know that this is not a demonic thing or uh, this is something which is a which is something um, he he is adapted from his parents or uh, mm. and how we can come uh, heal this family or how we can do uh, how we how we can I can get a solution of this. Thank you, Pastor. When the okay. only the wife so, is only the one who is approaching me and the one sister. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So so yeah, um, uh, Shrikpan, I mean, this is not as easy as a one, two, three step because uh, uh, remember, number one, it needs the willingness of multiple people to come in for help. If there is one member um, in a marriage who is not willing for help, there is hardly anything that you can do except use whatever resources you can to bring them in. Okay, like in this case, um, empowering the wife or empowering other resources like family to get get his help. Now, often in in such a case like what you're saying, where there is a lot of, and I would say that this has a lot to do with the personality. If you remember, we were talking about personality disorders, and a lot of this classifies under people who have personality disorders. You know, a lot of negative. Uh, uh, functioning is ingrained in their personality and that's the way they behave and they feel that's the right way and that's um, that's that's them right there is yeah there's no remorse there is no um, uh, no guilt uh, there is a sense of blame that's always thrown on another individual there is um, uh, no no factor of taking in uh, any form of advice from somebody and yes. if you read up on uh, personality disorder, you will find uh, a lot of these people fit into that personality disorder. Okay. And um, personality disorders come as a result of a lot of childhood upbringing, childhood issues, and it becomes ingrained into adulthood. And the people who suffer are the ones who live with them on a constant basis, whether it be wives or mothers or fathers or family members or employees, you will see that. Now, that's a personality issue. Now, again, as I've, as I've said, it opens the door to the enemy. It opens the door to the enemy. Now, you may be able to deliver one from such, but like how we learn in emotional wholeness, you have to journey into emotional wholeness. You have to journey you have to take that part, staying emotionally whole just by uh, casting out some casting out the spirit. OK, let's say a rebellious spirit. Uh, will not will not will free them of the spirit, but unless they keep themselves guarded, keep themselves in a place of humility and surrender to what uh, uh, you know what uh, the spirit of God is doing, being willing to be teachable, this is going to go back to itself, and and that we've we've learned. Okay, uh, this is places where you educate and let the spouse or whoever know that this is a concern. This is a problem. They are going through a, um, maybe, yes, there's a spiritual oppression. You probably prayed out and that's happened. But this is also something to do with the soul. It has a personality bond. It, it's, it's binding. It's been binding to his personality. And that needs regular intervention or regular help and counseling. So there, So on one hand, you're educating the family and saying that, you know, this is something that requires help and he will need help. And I, I know that very often it isn't easy to get people like this to get help because it, it really requires a humbling process for them 
to come to a place of change. And I'd say even those who have substance abuses or like addictions, they're also in this in the in the stage, you know. It takes it takes a while for that sanctification to happen. So it's not an easy journey. It's not an easy process. However, what you're doing on one hand is you are you you're attempting the best to bring them together, to get the husband or the spouse, whoever is the pro is a concern for help, maybe required medical psychiatric help just as well as going through some kind of spiritual discipleship and mentorship if they're believers, right? That's that's one part of it. And also, if, if you know, a lot of that doesn't work is to empower the wife, is to build her up, to bring her to a place of healing, bring her to a place of uh, standing on her, on her feet. Those are certain things that you need to do. And each of these cases are very, very different. Not all of them um, uh, follow a similar pattern. You know, some uh, there is a lot of positivity that you see. Some, uh, you know, it's a long haul. There is a there are a lot of challenges that come by. And uh, actually, the people to treat uh, uh, the 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 um, the people who are hardest to treat are those generally with personality disorders because it's so ingrained in their personality to bring them out of it requires a lot of uh, uh, one-on-ones, a lot of uh, getting them to personalize this problem and work through that. So it's not an easy route, Shri Kumar. Um, uh, but, but like I always tell, especially uh, caretakers of personality disorders, you know, and especially if they're believers, that your prayer, working with God, partnering with God to show you one step at a time is all that is something that can save you. You know, yes, you may need to do all the things that are in the in the natural counseling or psychiatric help or medication, all of that. But working with the Holy Spirit is that which holds on strong. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. I just have to, one more question because um, they are already completed their 25 years of marriage and uh, so many people told them to stay yes they were believers and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, many times uh, you know she asked me that whether uh, do you think that whether this marriage will work or not so so i am always clueless because i don't know because the way how the things are going on so i just want to, I, I just need a i just need a wise uh, advice from you just to do that what i should uh, say that whether because 25 years, somebody, everyone said that you stay, 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 stay. And it is very hard for them to go because you don't know that um, whenever he comes with a knife and whenever, uh, you know, mm. what is going to happen. And uh, so this is a very, a very terrific uh, situation sometimes. So, uh, Shri so Kumar, I mean, I, I, you know, I would say, I would personally say never give a person uh, a, a decision on what they should do. They should be the ones to take it. Because, um, he, you know, I've, I've had experience of people turning around and saying, I did it because you said so, right? Oh. And that was, that was never my intention. Oh, okay. But, uh, right, so being careful about how that you, um, you know, help her, like, like we looked at the last part, you know, strategize and say, okay, what are your options? What are your options? Okay, staying with him, not staying with him, um, being neutral, whatever. Let's say there are the two, three options. Help her to look at the pros and cons of each option and tell us, let her know that, you know, you use your wisdom to decide. Because it's very easy for them to finally take on a decision without well being well thought of and finally blaming you for it. Yes, so be very careful yes, to do you. that. Thank yeah? you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think we'll, uh, Samuel, I'll address your question next week. We are uh, already getting to 12. Let's quickly um, uh, close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have taken, you have brought each one of us, Lord, to this role of a helper, Lord, in ministry. God, even as we see, there are so many conditions and situations that that are beyond our understanding and our control, we have the greatest source and resource with us, and that is you, the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that any time we are faced with situations that need more wisdom and understanding, Lord, that we will not depend and trust on our own ways, on our own 
um, uh, on our own uh, skills, but Lord, we will look to you and that you will open out doors to help people in the right way, at the right time, in the right method. Lord, we cannot foresee very many things, but you have given us the power and the wisdom that when we ask, you will answer. Lead us into every truth, even as we deal with difficult cases and people and situations. Lord, that we will only do them good and nothing to harm them. Thank you for being our ready counselor, our great counselor, our efficient counselor. We, we submit ourselves at your throne of grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless. We yeah. shall meet you next week. Thank you all. Thank you for your patience. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.